Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Maxwell's House is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Maxwell's House with Ray Maxwell, episode 60 for February 19th, 2010. Digital color photography. Maxwell's House is brought to you by Go to My PC. Unchain yourself from your office PC and access it from anywhere with Go to My PC for your free 30-day trial. Visit gotomypc.com/twit. It's time for Maxwell's House, the show that covers just about anything uh, on the mind of Maxwell. Ray Maxwell is a color scientist, a raconteur, a Photoshop wizard, a digital photographer, a regular photographer, a glider pilot, regular pilot, everything you'd ever want, really, in a guy who could talk about just about anything. And he's uh, joining us right now from British Columbia, home of the Winter Olympics. Hello, Ray. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm good. Now, are, you're not affected by the Winter Olympics where you are, right? No, I'm far enough out. <laughs> but uh, I we have friends that live right downtown between uh, uh, two of the uh, main sites there, the Canada Place and the, the Bayshore Inn, where they're putting up the royalty and all the VIPs. So, uh, uh, And they say it's not as bad as they thought it was going to be. They're actually getting in and out of their place uh, fairly reasonably. So, you know. Uh, things are going fairly well. And how's the weather? Uh, well, today we have beautiful, beautiful sunshine, and I'm happy to say that it was well below freezing at all of the venues last night, and it's going to stay, but there's a high pressure area that's moved in now and pushed out the low, so we now have low temperatures at all the venues, Good. so the snow make Snow making equipment is functioning, and uh, during the day it's beautiful. So everybody's happy now. Woohoo! <laughs> so today our topic is the topic today. Uh, main topic is going to be about how digital cameras capture color. Ooh. But I've got a little potpourri at the beginning, of course, and uh, my first topic. Uh, sadly, is I'm going to talk a little bit about the luge accident where in which they had a fatality uh, right at, you know, before the opening of the Olympics. They were doing practice runs and warm-up runs with the luge racers. And unfortunately, uh, a fellow from the country of Georgia uh, was killed in an unfortunate accident. But what led me to think about this, and another question I'm going to cover, is when we deal with science, it is very important that we ask the right questions. And so many times recently, I have gotten, I, I want to pick up something and th <laughs> frankly throw it at the television because the reporter, in my opinion, isn't asking the correct questions. Oh, please. <laughs> you know? That's the least of it. I mean, in science, I, I'm trying to think in scientific terms. Right. Um, because, you know, if you ask a question like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, you're going to have a rough time coming up with the proper experiment to answer the question. So the first step in the scientific method is asking the right question, the right hypothesis, the right, you know, what's going on here. And uh, in such a way that it is a question that can be falsified or proven true. And um, the question that has been answered, asked on the media as soon as they had this accident at the um, Olympic site was, did the racer make a mistake? And was he killed because he made a mistake? And, and I can answer that question. I happened to be watching television when they broadcast the very first tape of the accident. Now, they later pulled it because it's pretty graphic, and mm. it was pulled from YouTube. So I am i didn't send you a copy because the IOC made YouTube pull it. But I, I happened to capture it on my PVR, and I brought it in to Final Cut Pro, and I slowed it down and did a very careful examination. 
And the answer is yes, the, the, the person made a mistake, but that, in my opinion, that's not the right question. But let me first tell you what happened in the accident, and then I'll, I'll finally get to what I'm, <laughs> I think should have been asked. The, unfortunately, the racer went very high in the very last corner of the race. It was the, the very last turn, and, and he was still way up at the top of the corner when the track straightened out. And so as the track straightened out or started to lose its curvature and lose the centrifugal force, he dropped almost straight down, went across the track, and hit the other side of the track, which is vertical. In other words, it's not curved. And so it flipped the sled, it rotated it, and flipped it upside down, and threw him up in the air uh, over the outside wall of the track. And unfortunately, the, the uh, imparted motion also, he rotated horizontally, so that instead of going feet first, he was going head first. Uh, and uh, the first part of his body contacted a very large galvanized steel beam that was about a foot and a half outside the edge of the track. So I, when I saw this, and by the way, when I saw this footage, they didn't know whether it was a fatal accident. But when I saw it, I said, I don't see how anybody could survive that. Because he went from 140 kilometers an hour to zero head first into a steel beam. Mm. And he dropped straight down. One of his shoes flew off and went over 100 feet, you know, from, the, from just his body being stopped suddenly. Just so horrible. Yeah, it was horrible. Now, the question that everyone should ask, in my opinion, is can you build a luge track... Can you engineer a luge track so that no matter what mistakes the person makes in the luge track, they are not thrown clear of the luge track and hit a steel beam? <laughs> I mean, and all you need to do, and by the way, they've done it, they've now put a wall in place. And I, they also put, uh, everybody was asking, well, why didn't they have pads on the steel beam? But at 140 kilometers an hour, the pads mean nothing. And they did put padding on them, but that, pads, that's... Yeah, no, no. It's, a, it's that's, the sudden deceleration that kills you. Right, right. That, those are totally superfluous. But what they did need to do is put a wall up to deflect the person smoothly in the direction of the track. You know, in other words, so that their energy is dissipated over a much, much longer distance. Now, even if you wall the track in such a way that they cannot leave the track, they can still hurt themselves. There was a Romanian woman earlier in the practice sessions who uh, did come down the track and did not leave the track, but went off the sled and tumbled, and she knocked herself unconscious, but she survived and because she slid down the track hundreds of feet after she had her accident. So, you know, the inner, you know, she didn't you stop. You've got to dissipate the energy gra more gradually. Precisely. Yeah. So, but nobody in the media was asking, you know, uh, can we build a safer track? It was all, did the guy make a mistake? And uh, I don't think it was the right question. You know, that's my, my take on it. Now, along those same lines, another thing that's in the, I, and I'm really going far afield here, so fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> but an, another place that I don't think anybody's asking the right questions is many are asking if the Christmas underpants bomber should have been given his Miranda rights and tried in the U.S. court. Hmm. And there's been suggestions that we should torture people and so forth. And there's been a great debate on all this. And I don't want to go into that debate or so forth. But I think uh, the, there, I think there was one person who asked the right question, but it was four or five years ago, and uh, and and I just want to remind people of it. And I don't know why no, I don't understand why no one is asking this question today. And what is and that? The question, and the question is: If a U.S. citizen, be they a soldier, private citizen, or CIA spy, is arrested or captured by a foreign power. How do we, U.S. citizens, 
want them to be treated. Yeah, that's a good point. Should they get due process? Should they be tortured? Should they be sent to a remote country and held without any rights or due process? That's the question. And, and to be fair, the only person I ever remember even touching on that was uh, John McCain uh, during the, the uh, Bush administration because he had been a captive and was tortured. And he, he was the one person who had experienced something from the other side who said the U.S. should not torture people. So, at any rate, why isn't anybody asking it? How do we want the rest of the world to treat our citizens? And well, that's the point of things like the Geneva Convention, is to establish a standard. Yeah, exactly. At any rate, those are my two uh, <laughs> ramblings for today. <laughs> good, good, good ones both. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, we can think rationally about this, but I just wonder why we don't get people asking those kinds of questions when they get in these big debates. And they, to me, they're getting off on tangents without really addressing the core issues. Right. All right. Now I meant to ask you, are we, should we have a break for any commercials today? Or? Well, that's a good question. Let me check the commercial <laughs> log. Yes, we should. So why don't we do that right now? Sure and, thing. Uh, this, this is a good spot for it. Good spot, because then we're going to talk about digital color, especially digital photography and how they do color. That's right. I think it's a great subject. You and I have talked about that a little bit before, and I can't wait to hear mm -hmm. more about it. But first, I want to tell you folks about Go To My PC. Go To My PC. Yeah. The great solution for Citrix that lets you access your office computer anywhere you are on the road, at home. In a hotel, in a sketchy internet cafe with GoToMyPC, you're safe, you're secure. You're able to do anything you could do at your office computer from anywhere. And it is so easy to set up. And really, that's that's kind of the message I'd like to pass along right now to you is how simple it is. If you've tried other remote access solutions, maybe you had to call the IT department or, you know, had to have, get a manual out. Not with, In fact, you could install GoToMy... I, here's a challenge. You could install GoToMyPC right now as I'm speaking in just a matter of minutes... No help from IT, nothing. Why be chained to your computer or desk when you can go home early? You can be with the family. You can take some time off. You can enjoy a vacation. If you're a small business owner like me, I tell you, you just don't feel like you can ever take any time off. You've always got to be there. Well, unchain yourself from your office PC. Access it from anywhere. And right, right now, try it free for 30 days. Go to go to mypc.com slash twit. G O T O M Y P C dot com slash twit. 30 day free trial, unlimited use, run any program, access any network resource, send and receive email. By the way, Mac and PC. We're going to use GoToMeeting in just a second. And you can see the, the, the speed with which it works, the, the ease. I'm on a Mac. I don't know if you're on a Mac Ray or not, but it doesn't matter because it just works cross platform. Go to mypc.com slash twit. Give it a try today. I think you're going to like it. All right, uh, let's talk about digital color. Ray, this is kind of really in your wheelhouse. This is the subject that you know more about than probably uh, most of us. <laughs> well, it's a subject near and dear to my heart. I, I've really enjoyed researching it over the years. And, it, and it's color science is far more complex than I ever dreamed it would be when mm -hmm. I uh, uh, started uh, studying on it. I thought, oh, this is something I'll study up for a couple of weeks and, you know, I'll know all about it and... You know, 20 years later, I'm still studying it. So, <laughs> any break, uh, what, what uh, used to drive me nuts when digital cameras first came out is all of the conventional photo magazines, as they were making the transition from film to digital, uh, they would start, of course, writing reviews about the digital cameras. And um, they would start commenting on the color that the camera produced. And I would just want to scream every <laughs> time I, I, you know, oh, this, this camera has a slight magenta cast and this one, you know, has a, has a little bit of a green cast to the colors or whatever. And I'm going, oh, give me a break. Because listen carefully now. Digital cameras do not output color. Whoa, whoa, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to play dumb here for a minute. What do you mean, Ray? <laughs> of course they do. I got a um, picture on my screen that shows they do. 
There you go. Well, the camera itself only outputs numbers. It outputs a digital file with numbers in it. Those digital files represent the uh, intensity or brightness of the, uh, that the sensors in the camera have picked up through a red, green, and a blue filter. However, the actual color that you get on your output device, be it your monitor or your printer, that those numbers have gone through a whole bunch of processing in your color workflow. And they have gone through software in your computer and so forth. They've gone through, or, or even they've gone through some processing in your camera before you see the little LCD view that you get on your camera. And so, depending on that processing, you can get any color from those numbers that you want. You can remap digital color to make it look any way you would like to. And there are filters you can actually buy that, you know, give your uh, the look of your digital files an ectochrome look or a kodachrome look or a right. fujichrome, right. you know. So... When you, when you hear somebody comment on just the color quality of the camera, they're blowing smoke. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole... Then. Yeah. Okay. The software and all of your digital workflow has a major effect on the final color you get. So you, you can't talk about the camera in isolation. You have to talk about an end-to-end -end mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. and how it reproduces color. And you can tweak it and adjust it to reproduce color just about any way you would like. So for let's go back, though, to the beginning of things, and let's have a look at how these cameras work. First of all, they have CCDs, charge couple devices, or CMOS, which is a type of integrated circuit technology that basically has light sensors. And we're not going to go deeply into the physics of those today. All we have to know is as they see more and more energy, uh, they put out higher and higher numbers. So if you were mapping them to 8-bit quantities, uh, black would be 0 and white would be 255. So all that's happening is we're taking the brightness range of our scene and mapping it uh, between 0 and 255, and we do it for the red, green, and blue uh, filters that they pass through. Now, the filters are not, in most cameras today, we have what's called a Bayer pattern. And I have a picture of it and uh, on my laptop here, which I'm sending via GoToMeeting uh, to Leo. And <laughs> you just, just in case I'm not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Testing. One, Testing. Two, three. Leo will be here any minute now. <laughs> and... Uh, here you can see, now what is interesting, if you look very carefully, you'll notice that half of the filters are green. And then one quarter are red and one quarter are blue. Half green, and a lot of people green, say, yeah. well, don't you want one third? You know, and it turns out no, because the majority of the luminance information, the brightness, is captured by the green sensor. So the, the green sensor is in the center of the spectrum and gives us both a, a large part of the luminance signal as well as the green data and combined. And then by reading the red and blue data around it and using very, very interesting and complex mathematical uh, uh, equations, they can combine this data and remap it so that you have all three RGB values for each pixel in your camera, which is quite a feat if you think about it. So if you have a, uh, let's just say a 10 megapixel camera, use round numbers, uh, five megapixels of that are green, and two and a half megapixels are red, and two and a half are blue. And they take the data from those three sets of filters and then map it into 10 megapixels, again, of RGB data. Uh, and uh, the, one of the experts at doing that is John Knoll of Photoshop fame. And, of course, Adobe Camera Raw. If you shoot raw, and I highly recommend shooting raw, uh, that's what has to happen. It has to take that raw 
image and it has to uh, remap it uh, into uh, 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 RGB data for each and every pixel. But it also has to do uh, something else. And let me just set this up here. Uh, the next thing I want to show you, I'm just going to, whoop, whoops, here, just a second. I want to show you. What I'm showing you here is that the CCD sensor and the or CMOS sensors both react to energy in a linear fashion. So that means uh, they react to the brightness of the scene. Unfortunately, the human eye does not react in a linear way. It acts in a logarithmic way. So I have these two charts here and the upper one what we can see is the first, let's say that we are digitizing this data, the raw data, at 12 bits. So we would have 4,096 values that we're dividing the brightness range into. A bright white would be 4,095, and the uh, black would be zero. So, but what is interesting is the first stop, in other words, uh, stops when you talk when you stop down your camera one stop or change the shutter speed one stop you're having or doubling the amount of light so I'm going to talk about stops as the brightness uh, in the scene as well so the brightest things in the scene that go from the very brightest thing to half that value occupy 2048 of the uh, the brightness values in the raw data. Now, this is in the raw data. This is linear with respect to energy. The next stop, or if we drop the brightness in the scene by half again, there's 1,024 values. And then the next stop, 512, 256, 128, and 64th, and so on down, 32, 16. So you'll notice that all of the shadows are crammed down here in the lowest part of the values and have the least quantization values. Now, this is the reason everyone says exposed to the right, because <laughs> the, you want to use all of those steps up in the highlights as best you can. And if you don't have anything in the scene that is as bright as that, you're not using those smooth values uh, up in the highlights. Now, when you take your raw data and you run it through a processor, uh, to make and map it into a what we call an editing color workspace. Now I'm talking about something like sRGB or Adobe 98. Those editing color spaces are linear with regard to visual perception. What do I mean by that? Well, it's mapping down here such that a middle gray will have a value of about 128. And the bright whites will be 255, and the blacks will be zero. So it is stretching out those, that shadow detail and uh, mapping it into a color space that is linear with respect to the human eye. And that's what Adobe Camera Raw or the processor inside your camera does when it uh, converts raw data into an editing workspace. Now, I'm just going to switch to another picture here uh, and talk about the workflow within the camera itself. We have a lens where the light comes in and the light falls on the CMOS or CCD chip. And then it goes through an analog to digital converter. The analog con and digital converter converts it into either six or sorry, 12 bit data is typical in most cameras, DSLRs. And in the very high end uh, medium format cameras, it, it can go as high as 16 bits. And that raw data is outputted uh, as either 12, 14, or 16 bit data uh, in a file that you bring in to something like Adobe Camera Raw or another raw processor. 
This is very important to understand. The only controls on your camera that are, affect your raw data are your ISO setting, your aperture, and your shutter speed. All of the other controls in your camera have no effect on the raw data that comes out of your camera. There are a few cameras, I won't go into it, that, that do have the odd control that has an effect on RAW, but the majority of cameras, the only controls that affect it are ISO setting, aperture, and shutter. In other words, exposure. The settings for sharpness, contrast, saturation, color tone, color space, white balance, have no effect on the raw data. And that's very important because that means that you're working with the data that's coming right out of your CMOS or CCD chip, and it's not being affected in any way. So you can do anything you like with it afterwards in the way of adjustments. So that gives you the most latitude. Now, this is real important as well. I mentioned a moment ago exposed to the right, and that simply means it, you want to open your camera up and expose such that your highlights are as on the histogram are moved as far to the right on your camera as possible without, without running into a wall there or without peeking out or saturating so that you don't have any uh, graduation in your highlights. So that's very important. But in order for your histogram to give you the correct reading on your camera, and this is something very few people point out in their digital camera classes. Go into your settings and adjust your contrast to the lowest contrast possible. And people say, what? You just told me that contrast has no effect on the raw data. And that's correct. It has no effect on your raw data. But it does have an effect on the image that's displayed on the back of your camera and the histogram. The histogram cannot be made from raw data. They have to make the histogram from the data that after it's been mapped into a color space like sRGB or RGB. And there's a processor in your camera that will do that to, for, to make the JPEG image. Now, you don't want to use the JPEG image. I'm not recommending that. But you do want to set the contrast wide open because that gives you the maximum dynamic range on your histogram. So you, your histogram sees the full dynamic range of the scene. If you turn up the contrast, it turns up the gain and it cuts down the amount of exposure range that your histogram displays. It has no effect on what's captured in your raw data, but it does have an effect on how your histogram is displayed. Did you know that, Leo? Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. Actually, okay. wait a minute. I think you told me that once before. Yeah, I've, I've, the, I forgot about it. Right. Yeah. That, that's very important if you want a uh, a histogram that shows you the maximum dynamic range of your camera. Right. And and even even then, I have experimented in some cameras with the with the contrast turned clear down. You can still expose a little more, or or you know, for the highlights, or a little less for the shadows, and still not. Uh, you know, in other words, your histogram can show that you're overexposed or underexposed, and in fact, you're not. You know, there's a little bit of headroom on both sides. So that's, that's important to know as well. Uh, but that's, that's very important uh, information uh, when you're setting up your camera and, uh, uh, you know, when you're doing this kind of mapping. Um, the other thing uh, to keep in mind is... Uh, 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 I will mention the term gamma. Almost everybody now has standardized on mapping into a color space with a gamma of 2.2. And that, two, for instance, the raw data has a gamma of 1.0, which is linear with regard to energy. And then we stretch out, we compress the highlights and stretch out the shadows. And when you do that, you do it by putting in what's called a gamma curve in your transformation curves, and uh, uh, you set that gamma to 2.2, which is the beginning slope of that curve. That's what that number means. And, um, and so then you map it into a, uh, a color space 
which is linear, with visually linear to the human eye. Now, again, let me repeat what that means. That means that if you make a change of five units in the highlights, like you go from 250 to 255, you'll get the same visual change as if you went from zero to five down in the shadows or moved five units anywhere in the scale. You'll get the same visual or perceptual change to your eye. So that's, uh, that's what Gamma 2.2 is about. And uh, that's what you want to do. And by the way, uh, for years, the Macintosh used a gamma of 1.8. Right. And I his, remember, they fixed it, though. Yeah, they yeah. fixed it in Snow Leopard. Right. <laughs> Just recently. Yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, the reason it was 1.8 for years was because the first, the first laser writer uh, had a gamma of 1.8. And you, they set their monitors to a gamma of 1.8 so that this is before color management and before they really knew what was happening. And they chose 1.8 and they stuck with it for years and years. Yeah. But uh, sRGB and Adobe 98 are both gamma 2.2. And now so, the Mac is. Yeah, and now the Mac is. Exactly. So, um, the next thing that I was going to touch on has to do with uh, color profiles. We talked about color profiles in a... By the way, this is the fourth uh, show in the series of four color shows. We, we uh, had a special show last week on aviation, so we, uh, you know, jumped those. But if you go back to shows uh, uh, 58, 57, and 56, they're all on color uh, on different aspects from the monitor, printers, and basic color science. So I talked a lot about profiles, and people always come to me and say, well, you know, you recommend profiling your monitor, and you recommend using the correct profiles for your printer. What about profiling the camera? And it's a, it's a different kettle of fish. Um, until recently, I didn't recommend profiling a camera unless... Uh, and when I say profiling a camera, I'm talking about using ICC profiles, International Color Consortium profiles. Uh, these are the profiles that you find in Photoshop and Lightroom and, and Aperture and all the various other color programs. Um, the ICC profile is very good for doing monitors and for printers. And if you were reproducing artwork. In other words, if you wanted very accurate reproductions of color artwork, then it's a good idea to profile uh, your camera. But you can only make an ICC profile for one lighting setup and one set of pigments. Mm. And as soon as you change, the ICC profile isn't accurate anymore. So it's somewhat limited for cameras. The other thing I said in an earlier show, and I can, I'll repeat it here, cameras don't have a color gamut. Monitors have a color gamut. Printers have a color gamut. And a color gamut means how big is the color space in LAB color that they can reproduce. But cameras, it turns out, will respond to wavelengths of light that we can't even see. So all I'm saying is, I, I shouldn't say it doesn't have any color gamut, but it has an enormous color gamut that's beyond uh, visual space, and it doesn't have a hard edge. Uh, a printer, once you print the most saturated color, that's the edge of the color gamut. You can't print anything more saturated, so there's a hard brick wall there. A camera, on the other hand, will respond to ultraviolet light or infrared light. And uh, so, it and, and it and the further you go out into those things, the less it responds. So it isn't a brick wall. So there's a difference between speaking of color gamuts of cameras than there is speaking of monitors or printers. However, you can uh, do some things that help you uh, uh, profile your camera. And the product I recommend for this is a new product that's only been out for a while. It's called x rite Color Passport. And it is a little chart. Let me grab one here. And what it has, it has three cards in it, three targets that you can use and include in your pictures. 
The first card is a white card that is, or a gray card actually, that is spectrally neutral. Now, this is important to understand. For years, everybody used Kodak gray cards. You know, you put a Kodak gray card in your picture uh, to have a reference point for what gray should look like in the particular lighting setup you're in. But I, I, ha I hate to tell everybody, but there's a carefully guarded secret. The gray card that Kodak sold for years and years and years for film use is not what we call spectrally neutral. What do, what do we mean by that? What we mean is it doesn't, if you, if you did a, a uh, took a spectral photometer and checked the gray on the Kodak gray card, it doesn't respond the same way across the whole spectrum. So if you use it in different kinds of colored light, uh, warm light or cool light, uh, sunset lighting or north skylight, uh, it, it doesn't reflect the same amount of light across the entire spectrum. So that isn't correct. Now, this gray card that is included with the X-ray Passport is spectrally neutral, and you can use it as a gray card. Now, there are two other charts that come with the x right Passport, and this one is a standard color chart, and it just has a whole bunch of different uh, colored squares, and it has a grayscale, and what you can do is you can include this in the first shot that you shoot in, and then this package comes with software by x right and I have to say, this is right now at least, this is only usable with Lightroom, and Adobe Camera Raw. And right now, as far as I know, you can't use it with Aperture or any of the other programs. So x right and Adobe got their heads together and, and figured this out. But what it does is it makes what's called a DNG profile. And DNG profiles can be used with Adobe Camera Raw and with Lightroom and you go in and choose that profile for the particular setup, and the thing, uh, the thing will map your colors more accurately and uh, give you more saturated colors, in most cases, in your scenes. Works extremely well. Now, that's called a single illuminant profile, and you would have to put this little card in the first shot of each time you change your lighting setup. But they go further than that. Uh, the next thing you can do is you can um, do what's known as a dual illuminant profile. And what you do is you go out and you shoot this card in very warm light, like tungsten light, and then you shoot it again, illuminated by, let's say, a northern skylight, which is a very, very cool light, has a uh, very high color temperature. And it, having those two points it will make a profile that you can then change the white balance. And by the way, you have to set the white balance even when you do a single illuminate uh, profile. And, um, and it will make you a profile, though, that you can use in any lighting. And then you just take a white balance reading off of the, uh, the, the middle gray here in this gray card, and, uh, and you will get a picture that is accurate. Now, some people have awakened to the fact we don't always want our pictures to be accurate. Because the truth of the matter is, Caucasian skin tones are kind of white and pasty. <laughs> and we always like them a little warmer uh, and, and so forth. So they have another chart on here. And I don't think it will show uh, on television. But these gray cards here in the center of this chart are graduated, and, and one on one side is much warmer, and it goes to a very cool gray uh, color on the other. And you can use this to do creative white balance. So now what you do, and this is, this is gonna sound backwards, if you want your scene, you shoot this in one of your pictures, and when you go into Photoshop, uh, or Adobe Camera Raw, or Lightroom, and you have this little eyedropper that you can say, make this gray, what you do is you click, if you want to warm it, you click on the bluest square here of these grays, and it will warm the scene. 
In other words, you're fooling it. You're showing it a, a gray that's slightly cool, and it says make that neutral gray, and that warms the rest of your scene. If you want to cool the scene, then you click on the uh, warm square, and uh, it will just very slightly uh, shift the white balance of your scene. But it does it in a very controlled fashion, and you can do it the same way every time. The other thing that's really nice about this system is that it, if you have more than one camera, and, and, and even if they're the same model and brand, you will find that most digital cameras don't produce exactly the same numbers uh, due to filter variation and so forth. But certainly, if you have two brands of cameras, you can make a profile for each camera, and then it will allow you to reproduce the color accurately across your whole set of cameras. Uh, by producing a profile for each of the cameras. So that's uh, all about the uh, Color Passport. They have an excellent tutorial online at X-Rite for this product. And uh, they also give webinars. I attended one of their webinars uh, using like... Uh, uh, what, what's the Citrix product, Leo? That's, uh, there's, there is a go-to-webinar web product. Go-to-webinar, go to, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they did a web... Uh, a uh, webinar on that and it was excellent in showing how to use it and so forth so uh, uh, do the tutorial and I think this will add to the quality of color you get and uh, the accuracy and mainly the fact that you can get consistent color because you may want to warm it or cool it but you know exactly how much you're doing it this way so uh, that's where we're going with that we're running a little bit short of time, Ray, because we have uh, the genome folks uh, ready and standing in the wings. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they did show up. They okay. did. All right. Very happy to say. Well, we uh, I think I've covered the topic, and uh, I think we can wrap it up at this point. Very interesting stuff, I have to say. Yep. And, and helpful, because if you understand how the camera works, things like that, you know, where the histogram's getting uh, picked up is really important, very valuable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, Ray. Any, any last-minute questions? Um, I don't see any in the chat room. I'll tell you what. <laughs> if you've got them, yep. give them to Ray. Ray at twit.tv. That's his address. You can email him. And uh, we talk every week. Normally, uh, we're a little off schedule today, but normally at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, which is, uh, I think, 2300 UTC at live.twit.tv. And you can right listen on. now on the, the podcast. We're soon to be video as well because I know people want to see it. Although ODTV does have the video at ODTV.me. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Leo. See you next time on Maxwell's House.